His name is Gil And he's mentally My name is Gil Kruger, and in this show, I go deep with content creators on their struggles with mental health. On this season of Mentally Gil, we're focusing on anxiety and burnout. This week, my good friend Brian Reesberg enters the chat. We talk about imposter syndrome, having an exit strategy, and what it's like to launch your own product as a creator. Hi, I'm Brian Reesberg. I am a pet influencer parent of Maxine the Fluffy Corgi and co-founder of Little Chunk. Yes, you heard that right. We have our very first pet creator, or should I say pet paw rent, on the podcast. See what I did there? Maxine the Fluffy Corgi is the most followed corgi on social media, boasting over 5 million followers and a People's Voice Webby Award to boot. Later in the show, you'll hear Maxine pining for attention in the background. Her owner Brian and I were at film school at around the same time, We didn't meet until about six years ago. We bonded over the fact that he was a content creator and that he had a corgi. Fun fact about me, I'm obsessed with corgis. I grew up with them and have lots of corgi-themed paraphernalia in my apartment. At the time of this recording, I'm two weeks into having one of my own. Wanna say hi, Maisie? Okay, that was a sound effect, but I swear she's real. Anyway, Brian didn't grow up with corgis like I did. So I grew up in Bethesda, Maryland. It's right outside of Washington, D.C. We lived sometimes, and we were in Bethesda and then kind of Cabin John. So Bethesda, Cabin John. My mother worked at Bloomingdale's, and my dad worked in sales. And what kind of kid were you? In preschool, I was very talkative. I was the youngest of three, so uh, I just, I I needed attention all the time because uh, I was competing with an older brother and an older sister. So very annoying. I was a very annoying kid. Everyone knows you now as like a dog person. What was your sort of pet situation throughout the years? Growing up, I had two dogs. I had a chocolate lab named Max. It was a boy, and we had a cocker spaniel named Didi. I think it was like any other kid. I liked enjoying hanging out with them and didn't enjoy taking care of them. Tell me about high school. Like, were you a creative kid? In high school, I don't know why I remember, but like I would have on Friday nights, like sophomore year, I couldn't drive yet, or maybe it was freshman year, I'd have my mom take me to Potomac Pizza. I'd get a medium pizza. We'd stop by Blockbuster. I'd get a tape. I'd, <laughs> I'd eat the entire pizza and then watch a movie. And then it was like junior year, I got like a group of friends and we would hang out and dick around. So I joined the high school news program to like crack jokes. Wasn't really that funny, but uh, I started honing my video production skills. I started uh, learning how to edit because that's, that's like joke writing. You know, how can I craft something so that it can be entertaining or funny? Brian graduated and attended NYU's film school, where he focused on directing. Now we'll get to his anxiety in a bit, but first I want you to understand his path to becoming a social media creator, because that's really when the worrying started. What year did you graduate? I was in the class of 2010, but I graduated a year early. I just wanted to be out. Yeah, it was a lot of money and I didn't see any value in taking time to go through the classes just to learn things that in my naivety, I thought I'd already learned. You know, I didn't really want to make a long form short film. I wanted to do music videos and commercials. And I got an internship freshman year at a production company called Smuggler, which oh, the wow. year I think when I worked there, they won the Palm Door at, at Cannes for, you know, production company of the year. They were amazing, amazing directors working like John Watts was there when I was there. That was my freshman year. I remember the guy who interviewed me said, this isn't really appropriate, but I'm going to do it anyway. And he asked me to bring my laptop and he just starts looking through it. He was, he was a great guy. He was like, he was one of my early mentors. And he started looking through it. And I go, what are you doing? And he goes, I'm not looking at any porn. I just want to see if you're organized. Which was like a really roundabout way. And, uh, you know, you couldn't <laughs> do that today. You couldn't take somebody's laptop and start looking through their shit. So I started working on a script, building out like, you know, I had all these friends who had all these talents. Um, I met a, a film producer who became still one of my best friends. And we just started working on projects. And through that, I had this script that was like a, a road trip movie. I was 23 when I wrote it. I pitched it to an actor. He loved it. 
he had a buddy who worked out in London who had a connection with a financier who got a budget of like $150,000 and we were off. So we spent two months in Mississippi shooting a movie. And then it was accepted at South by Southwest. It premiered there in 2014. It was bought by Oscilloscope. I'm looking for the world's largest bottle. What does it look like? It's like a really tall bottle. The movie was called Big Significant Things, and it came out in theaters in 2014. As Brian started to put together his next project, he was figuring out how to make a living. And at the time, throughout all of this, I was working in advertising. I was working in advertising since I graduated from college because I needed the money. There, there was simply no way to make movies without an income. A lot of my friends and peers were in very fortunate positions where they could do that. Then I left advertising. I left the day job to join a production company. It wasn't going that well, you know, like the work wasn't coming in and it was still like a struggle to like keep making stuff and to try and build out my career. And my wife at the time was just extremely patient because that cut our income in half for me to try and, you know, direct commercials. And then we got married and decided, you know, kind of another, probably not the smartest decision at the time. We wanted a dog and that was our wedding gift to each other. We had planned it for years. We wanted a Corgi. We followed a bunch of Corgis and we just thought they were the cutest things in the world. And they just seemed like really funny and playful. And we didn't, we didn't know how, how alike we were that they're just, they're, they're psycho dogs in the best way. They're all over the place. They're needy. They're cute. They're funny. They're playful. They're silly. Uh, they're little assholes. And I remember being at the production company because I would go there every day just to, you know, have a desk to sit at. And a fellow director, you know, asked me, like, why, why are you getting a dog? Like, why are you mm -hmm. do you shouldn't be doing this? You should be working on your next script. You should be working on treatments. You should be working on your career. This is going to put a wrench in that plan. And I, I didn't really pay it any mind. I just kind of looked at him. So we got uh, we got Maxine in February of 2016. And this was a few months after we saw Mad Max Fury Road, which I mean, that movie just melted my mm -hmm. fucking face off. Oh, what a day. What a lovely day. Like, I saw that in theaters twice. I remember, like, crying the second time I watched it because you could just feel the the hard work that went into that movie, the craftsmanship. And it was just, it was mm -hmm. just a wonderful experience. We, we named her Max, and we made this Instagram account for no reason. This was in 2016. I was like, oh, just take pictures. She's a really cute dog. I'll just share her online. Just as, like, a way to, like, you know, crack some jokes just to keep making people laugh or to, you know, to, she really was such an adorable puppy. Like, what was the theme of the account and how did it change over time? So Instagram, <laughs> Instagram back in the day used to be a photo sharing platform. Uh, so I, <laughs> you know, I loved, I loved, uh, you know, I love photography. I love taking pictures. And it was always really funny to me to, to attribute some kind of human emotion to this like really fluffy dog. She was just, she would do funny shit all the time. Uh, anything, the way she walked, the way she barked, the way, like every single thing this dog did, I just thought was hilarious. So it was like this, can I, can I get like, can I get like the picture? What's the, I would go out with her. Uh, and we lived on the Upper West Side and I would go out in Central Park with her. And it was like a treasure hunt. You know, I knew that in an hour I would have like a, some piece of gold, which was a photo of like her fluffy butt or her doing something silly. I would go out, I would take like a thousand pictures. I would come back, I would go through them all and I would find the one. And then it would just hit me with a movie quote because, hey, growing up, me and my brother and sister, we would just sling movie quotes at each other. My brother ever said to me like, they were cupcakes. And I would yell back, they were cones, which was a movie quote from Wedding Singer. I wasn't a really good student, but I think the the rhythm of the way people spoke or the lines that that made us all laugh, they were just like burned in our head. So we'd just be slinging movie quotes to each other. So I throw up a picture and it would just hit me with a, a movie quote. People loved it. So I would bring her to work with me every day because we didn't have the money for daycare and I just didn't want to leave her at home. And at the time, the MTA set a new rule saying that dogs had to be in bags to ride the subway. So I started taking her to work in a tote bag. And she came with me to work every day. And then the social media account started growing. 
social media and influencers started becoming more of a thing. And as it grew, I started very, very slowly putting more time into making things. So what happened was the the production company thing, you know, I had to call my landlord to say like, hey, we're going to be a little bit late on rent. And I remember we were standing outside of a Trader Joe's, my wife and I, and this was a year and a half to me not having a job. And she was so patient. And I just remember we're outside of Trader Joe's and we just look at each other and she looks at me and goes, listen, I think it's time. I think it's time. Maybe you need to start looking for a job. So uh, I did that. I brought Maxine to the interview. I brought Maxine every day to that other ad agency and then another ad agency. When I was going into work every day, I would take her in a tote bag. And then she got too big. It was She was 25 pounds. It was too much weight on the left side of my body. And, you know, on the subway, it just got annoying. So I started looking for something better. Is there something that maybe can center the weight on my body or something that's just like more fun than a tote bag? I found like it's a backpack. I found it in a little pet store, actually in the turnstile subway station below Columbus Circle. And <laughs> I started wearing it and it was fun. You know, it was like this, it was like a Jan sport with holes. It wasn't anything special. And she seemed to enjoy it. And then down the road, we, you know, I would start noticing people behind me like giggling and petting her. So I would turn the camera and just film over my shoulder. And these reactions I would put on Instagram stories when Instagram stories like just started. And I remember getting a DM, somebody saying, oh, you should put a compilation together. So I did it and I kept filming more and more. And it started going viral. Every video clip on Reddit, on Instagram. I was like, what? Like, what's happening? We started growing so much faster and it was just insane. And since 2016, like five years, that was my strategy. Like, take my dog everywhere. Let people pet her. You know, it, it's weird to see so many people smiling on the subway. It, it just became a thing, and I just went with it. I listened to the things that people were saying. The thing, you know, people wanted to meet her. She started getting more famous. Got an agent. We started doing brand deals, you know, all that stuff. And it just became our thing that she was the dog in the backpack. For Brian and Maxine, brand deal income started becoming meaningful. But with this success came new kinds of stress and anxiety that will be familiar to a lot of creators. How would you describe your anxiety? Personally, I find it difficult to talk about because it is such a prevalent topic, uh, especially in, you know, the, the creator economy, anybody who makes anything. I mean, I, th I think it's just it's something that's always been there for a lot of folks. And now we're talking about it more. And maybe I didn't recognize it, but I don't remember historically being an anxious person. I, I don't know whether it, it's we've talked about it more. I wouldn't want to be flippant to people who really have debilitating anxiety because I don't think I have debilitating anxiety. But I worry a lot. I'm in my head it's now seemingly a byproduct of the career I've chosen. It's just a part of, in my mind, and, and this probably isn't the healthiest response, but it just seems like a part of the job to just be constantly thinking, rethinking, not able to turn off your brain, wanting to keep making stuff, can't compartmentalize, you know, all those things that mm -hmm. could be diagnosed by a doctor. I don't want to minimize the, the mental stress that I know so many people are under simply by saying that me being a nervous Jew is somehow a medical condition. Listen, I cavort with a lot of Jews. We're all the fucking same, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and it's passed down from generation to generation. I, I, I think there's different levels of it. Do I think it's getting worse? Yes. I think social media exacerbates conditions that have potentially laid dormant in people. Uh, I also think we're talking about it more. Do I think this is anything new? No, we're just talking about it more. Or maybe people are able to recognize it more. I mean, everybody's going through it. It's a human condition. It's a part of growing up and having responsibilities and just living. You said that you don't want to downplay other people who have like more serious anxiety, but you, you seem to have something going on. Oh, thanks. <laughs> no, I mean, like, I think anybody who's in a field that they're passionate about I think a lot of people have the, these kind of like toxic, self-destructive thoughts. You think about if you're doing the right thing, if you're good enough to do the right thing. Um, I don't know, imposter syndrome. You think your outtake's real and you, you match it up with somebody's highlight reel because that's all you see from other people. What are some things that you would consider like debilitating in your line of work? Just, it, just that it, it's constant. There's no reprieve. You know, you put something out there, it does well in, in terms of like a piece of content or... 
you know, something that might move the needle on your account. And then it's really you're constantly moving the goalposts, which, I, you know, that happens as you get better and better. You just have new goals to achieve, but it just keeps moving. So at certain times it just feels like to what end? What's the point? You know, you wonder if like what more I could be doing or what more would another like what opportunities would would be different. But I guess it's all it's all really specific because, you know, even the things that we do that, you know, we don't put that much value in. They've been like the most valuable to us, like a gardening shop invites us to an opening. You know, that has nothing to do with Maxine, but they're nice people. It's around the corner and we meet other creators and other influencers that they invite. And then we make stuff with them if we become friends with them. So it's just a weird world to navigate because there's no formula. Have you ever taken a break? And what happens to your following? I've never taken a break. The only break I think I've ever taken was uh, we got robbed in Mexico about a month ago. I didn't have my phone for like four days. That's the only break. I didn't take that break myself. It it wasn't my choice. And it was funny because when we got back, we had tons of messages of people who were like, we were worried, like, where are you? Because we post every day. It feels like you're letting people down if you don't post. And then there's the flip side that, like, people will forget about you, which I know isn't true, but, you know, it's still there. When you got robbed was the first thought that ran through your mind, what about my account? No. When we got robbed, my first thought was, oh my God, these guys have a gun to me in my wife's chest. Like, please take whatever you want. After all the uh, stuff was out of the way, you know, kind of going through... It's like at five in the morning now trying to call all of the banks and cancel everything. But, you know, they had my ID, which had my birth date on it. And because I'm a moron, that used to be my passcode to my iPhone. And I thought there is a world in which somebody opens that phone, starts looking through stuff, sees an Instagram account with a lot of followers. So that became a very big concern to me. And I even said to my wife, like, I feel like such an idiot. All I'm doing is worrying about the Instagram account. And she looked at me, she goes, it, it's not weird. It's your livelihood. It's important. Can you think of anything that, like, w- with regard to the account that you were really stressed out about at the, in the moment, but now that you think back, you're just kind of like, there. W- what was I worried about? Anytime we do a meet and greet, I'm enormously stressed out beforehand. Tell me about the meet and greets. Oh, yeah. There, there's tons, like so many people. So many people want to meet this dog. So we had, we didn't do meet and greets for a long time. We just started doing them maybe like just as the pandemic started lightening up, maybe in, 20, in the beginning of 2021. And we didn't start doing them because mentally I couldn't get there. Like, what am I going to do? I'm going to go stand in a park and people are just going to come meet us. And it made me feel weird. It made me feel like what I was doing was stupid. You know, I still have, you know, voices, which I'm sure as we all do, thinking like, I'm going to look like an idiot. Like, people are going to think stupid. Like, I bring my dog on social media. Like, I just want it for attention. Like, just all the shit that people would just chirp in your ear about or just, like, look at you. You know, it's I, I get uncomfortable filming in public sometimes, like, because I just think people are looking like, look at this fucking idiot with his dog. Like, get a real job. Mm-hmm. You you attention whore. I can just hear people. I think the reality is that nobody's thinking that. Maybe there's one one asshole thing that, but I think the reality is nobody's thinking that because the worst part of a meet and greet are the two days leading up to it. When I just sit at home and I think about like when I get there, like, is there going to be like a line? How are people going to know? Uh, are they just going to like stand around me? I'm trying to I'm trying to like synthesize into words what it feels like. It's because I've always been the young kid. I've always been the younger brother. I've always been the youngest one on a film set. So I've always been the one who the older ones pick on. And I've always been the one who needs to learn. I've always been, you know, like I remember at that at the internship at Smuggler, I remember seeing a, a text message from one of the older kids being like, oh, you know that, you know, this is when I was a freshman. I had just moved mm-hmm. to New York. Like he's so oblivious. Like I didn't know shit in everything that I do. I do not know shit. There are always people that I try and be quiet for. I'm trying to be quieter the older I get so I can listen from other people. So to be in a position where I have some autonomy in what I'm doing, it feels like a very big risk. And it feels like somebody's looking at me being like, you fucking idiot. Why are you doing this? Like, mm-hmm. grow up. Or that's not what you should be doing. Or like, how do you think you you should be doing it? You know, it's all, it's all a risk because I've never been the one to do it. I've always been the one watching other people do it. So to be in a position where I'm the guy somebody's looking towards, it's almost as if I imagine everybody else looking at me thinking, let's watch him fail or let's watch him think he knows what he's doing. 
So mm-hmm. it's been imposter syndrome my entire life because mm. any moment where I would step out of my own shell growing up, I would just be pushed back in. And and I, that's not to say that it was a, a, like a, I was bullied a lot. I, I wasn't bullied. It was just older brother bullshit. Right. So when you when you step out and finally think that here's something I'm going to do, you think, all right, somebody's about to call what I want to do stupid. So the worst part of the, of the meet and greets, it's all in my head. Because when I actually get there, when mm-hmm. I'm physically there, it's the fucking best. It is the best. Everybody is so happy to see this dog. You know, people say afterwards, like, how nice I am, which I love that. I, I mm-hmm. love that. I try and be as, I like, I, I, I mean, I don't try to do anything. I just want people to see her. I never noticed all the weird noises I make when I'm watching my dog meet people. <laughs> so cute. That's why we make compilations of me giggling because it's it's just it's so silly. You know, people have cried petting this dog on my back. So while I'm there at the meet and greet, it's it's, it's honestly the best. If I could just if you could just put me there without anything leading up to it, great. But it's really just like, you know, I remember we did a Grubhub activation last summer where it was a whole day of meet and greets, three places in the city. Mm -hmm. I was a wreck for a week. I was like spiraling. I would like pace around the house, talking to my wife like, this isn't going to go well. I'm so nervous. How am I going to do this? And and then once once I'm there, it's like everybody's so nice. And like they get it. They understand like this, you know, people left work in the middle of the day and They think it's silly, too. I think it's silly. We're all laughing. They can come pet the dog. We're just talking. It's all very oddly normal because we all know how ridiculous what we're doing is, but it's just really fun. People come on their lunch break. So it's uh, it's pretty scary. It's scary to think that, that something you're building is built upon smoke and mirrors, to feel like it could be. But luckily, we've proven that it's not. So that's that's nice. Have you ever been like massively disappointed by either like a piece of content that you put out or an activation that you did? Yeah, all the time. The content, you know, because I have a film background, sometimes, you know, I want to make things look a certain way or feel a certain way, which is many, many times the things that I want to do to a piece of content are to the detriment of it performing well. Like I remember two summers ago in the pandemic, you know, we wanted to start making content about toys, but like, you know, uh, puzzle toys that are, uh, like, thoughtfully designed by... Uh, it's actually designed by a woman in Sweden named Nina Ottosen. Ottosen. But it's with Outward Hound. She has a partnership, and she has these puzzle toys and dogs of different intelligence levels figuring out these puzzles to get the treats. And I had this whole thing where I wanted to make it, like, a wrestling match. So it would be between Maxine and this toy. And I downloaded all these graphic packages, all these templates, spent weeks customizing them. So it was, like, a traditional boxing or wrestling intro. Uh, I brought in my buddy who uh, who's a copywriter and a hilarious guy. And we did like, uh, we did commentary analysis uh, on Maxi doing the video and tons of shit. Today, we're going to see Maxi and the fluffy corgi go up against the toughest toys in the pet game. Today in the Rough House, we got a good one for you. A real David versus Goliath as Maxine goes up against the dog brick. It took forever, and it was awesome. And it was just like a fart in the wind online. Nobody gave a shit. Or it didn't perform well, or however, I, you know, whatever I did. That, that happens a lot, though. I mean, you see that all over TikTok, where people spend, like, so much time on these videos, and then they just don't do well. But then, of course, when you're just sitting there, just casually, you just throw something up, and it just flies. Has running this account ever put, like, a strain on your relationships? Oh, yeah, sure. You know, and you spend too much time focusing on it during off hours, like at the dinner table, you did a post, it's doing well, you want to keep responding to messages and keep engaging with people. Uh, Or you're trying to relax on the couch, but like, you know, Max is doing something cute. So you want to get yeah, it, 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 it totally impedes on things all the time. But it's been like that for six years. It's just a matter of sometimes it's fine. And 
my wife or the people I'm with are like, oh, you know, just let him do it. He'll be done soon. And it, it really doesn't get in the way. Or sometimes, yeah, really have to really have to put the phone down. I suppose as this has become more of a business that it's probably more acceptable. As long as we can plan beforehand, like, you know, we went on a beach trip. You know, Max was there and I would always just be vocal about like, oh, I want to do this or I want to make this. Like those are kinds of my goals when we go on trips is it's a, also a fun opportunity to make some stuff. And I try and do it in a way that doesn't impede, but it's just going with the flow of what the event is and making it fit in a fun way and, you know, involving people or not involving people. What's your support system like when things get tough? It's hard to talk about this stuff with people because it seems stupid. It seems really stupid and it seems like you're the cause of all your problems. You know, just just stop doing this or, you know, just put your phone down. Like, that's not a solution. And you can't really bring these problems to people who don't do it because they don't they don't get it. Uh, and I also don't want to put people in a position where they have to, like, give me advice without really knowing what they're going through. So really, it's just, you know, I, I work through this stuff with my wife sometimes when she doesn't even isn't even in a place to help. You know, she's very patient on a, on a lesser scale. Like I, you know, I have my business partner that I talk through stuff with, but I'm always very conscious of taking up too much of his time with my bullshit, which I know if he heard this, he would say like, well, you know, that's that's what I'm here for. But, you know, sometimes I, I, I know I can ask a bit much of people. What about other creators? Casually, we talk about it. We all have the same thoughts. Like I was riding on a plane uh, home from South by with another very talented creator. We talked about the same shit. Once somebody opens up that that floodgate, you can kind of just unload on each other. <laughs> you know what your what your issues are, and very frequently we have the same issues. Whether it's not trusting certain people that you work with, not trusting that you're getting the best advice or the best service, not trusting yourself that you're making the right decisions and not really knowing what the solution is. Talking to other creators, they're like mini support groups. When you see that somebody else is growing faster than you or videos are doing better, especially like, I mean, you put so much craft into a lot of your work that it must drive you nuts. No, I think I firmly believe in rising tides in the pet community because we're all different. You know, rising tides lift all boats. So one of us does well, we all do well. It's not when somebody's videos do better because I can usually tell why a video is doing like, oh, that's really cute or it's, you know, it, the craft isn't a part of it anymore. I don't I don't hold craft of the same value. It's more like if you captured a specific moment and you were able to pair it with a trend to create some kind of effect, like that's creative to me. You know, people who who can take something and memify it. There's nothing that really annoys me anymore, to be honest. Like we're pretty successful. You know, we're we're the most famous corgi on on social media. I've been doing it for six years. I'm just more tickled with people who are just getting started, people who don't have a creative background and who find it using TikTok or Instagram because it's like, oh, this is working. I can make money doing this. Let me keep going. Like that to me is so fucking cool. What sorts of anxieties does does being a content creator pose for you? When it's part time, you got nothing to lose and everything to gain. But now when it's your full time job, it, it's just such a different ballgame. It's 24 seven. It's always at least for me, I have trouble compartmentalizing it. I have trouble separating work life and personal life. It's debilitating. Like there's so many things that are so untenable about living this way. I guess it's it's tough because there's so much that's out of your control, you know, but you just keep ruminating on it, whether it's a follower account or why this video does well or why that video doesn't do well. Because right now I'm thinking every day I think about the day that this dog is going to die. I think about living without like my best buddy. It's not even about like the work. It's just what's this life going? What, what's life going to look like? after this. And right. I'm trying to put myself in a position to be okay. And how are you doing that? Probably working on an exit strategy, you know? Like, do I want to be like running around the city, making stuff and collaborating, doing all this fun stuff and going to parties and bringing her and just saying yes to every opportunity, which is what we do. We say yes to everything because every opportunity, we've met so many wonderful people that like, you know, the sill, which is this wonderful uh, plant store in Brooklyn. They were like, hey, Maxine, do you want to come out? We're doing an opening. You know, that doesn't make any fucking sense to me. Why would I bring a dog to a plant store opening? But they have like a fun Instagram account. The people are so nice. It's a few miles away and people love to see Max. So why not bring her? I brought her there. 
I met another creator. Through him, I met another creator that we made a short film together. And it was like, it's amazing how that works just by being like, yes. So we've said yes to everything. And it's hard because it's stressful. You know, even people I don't know, it's like, I don't want to be rude. I don't want to say no. I don't want to cancel. And I know the kind of joy that this dog brings to people. Like, is it, yes, it's fun for me to go. It's fun for me to get attention. It's fun for me to feel like, oh, there's that dog with all of those fucking followers. Like, that's cool to me. It's cool that we've built this. But it's also cool because it, like, puts me at ease to put her in front of people, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, it makes me it makes me feel better. It makes me feel like I'm doing something. Whereas if I didn't, I would be sitting here and I'd be thinking, okay, what do I have to make this thing? When So when you ask, like, what are you doing to make yourself feel okay when this is all over, when, when she mm-hmm. dies, it's – Seizing every opportunity we can to see what this could be, because I still am not sure what I'm doing yet. Like, what is this for? It's important to note that during all of this, Brian was still working a full-time job in advertising. Eventually, it got to the point where Brian wanted to pursue content creation full-time and to launch a pet backpack of his own. It wasn't until last October, six years after starting this Instagram account, that, uh, and I spoke to my wife, I said, Hey, I think I think we're in a different situation. Here's the decision that I would like to make. What do you think? And I I think she was surprised I hadn't done it sooner, to be honest, which was leave advertising and be a full time creator because we were in a position where the account at the time in October of 2021 was upwards of 800,000 followers, a few million on TikTok. It was a a pretty decent income. It got to the point where I was uh, with a manager who asked me, you know, what do you what do you want to do? What I want to do is I want a new bag because I don't I never liked any bag that we used. I never liked the backpack. It didn't feel supportive. It was very difficult to use. The materials were not good. It broke down very easily. And a lot of people were coming to us asking us, how how can I do this? How can I bring my dog everywhere? What's the product you're using? And I couldn't recommend it. I felt really bad recommending it. I felt bad because mm. it, it would be a lie. It'd be a straight up lie because I was I was really good at showing off like how fun this thing is. But there were there were so many parts of it, like it just wasn't easy to use. It wasn't built well. And I was like, just, I, this sucks. This sucks because I know we're throwing a lot of business to this company who I can't support. And then I started working with somebody who presented, he, he literally said, like, let's let's just do it. Let's build a backpack. Let's do something better. And that is a crazy thought to me. Like, I'm not. I'm not an inventor. I'm not, I don't know anything about Mm -hmm. doing that. It's not something you do until you do it. You know, like, how do you get into that? It's a weird thing to realize that there are people that are looking to you for an answer on something because they feel like you have more experience or more expertise on something. And so at some point it was like, I had to step up to the plate. I had to learn more about the health and wellness of my own dog and how her body can be fully supported by the products we're using. You know, I just took it a little bit more seriously because I knew what I was working for. I was working for hundreds of thousands of other people who wanted a similar product. So it was incumbent upon me to do the research, to build a good product, and to work with really talented people so that people could do what we're doing. Like, that's the whole, that's the point. Why am I Why am I sharing this shit on social media if not to inspire other people to go out and do cool shit with their dog? For the past year, we've been working with some of the best product designers, veterinary specialists, and manufacturers in the world, designing, developing, and testing the s*** out of a bag that was created by people who would die to protect their pets and wouldn't settle for anything less. So after years of hard work, I'm proud to present the Maxine One Dog Backpack. It's taken us aback. Like We get very emotional messages from people who followed us, who have gotten a dog because of us, who bring their dog everywhere with them because of us. It's a, it's a lot of responsibility and Honestly, it's the most important part of the job to me is just working for all of these people and feeling like I'm in a position to improve the lives of other pet parents and their dogs. I never thought there was a better feeling than uh, than getting a laugh. Yep, there's a better feeling than getting a laugh. And it, it's getting messages from people who, like, we got... Oh my God, I get so emotional. We got, a message, we got a message from somebody. Uh, hey. I wanted to give you a huge thank you. My corgi had to cross the rainbow bridge today. Thanks to the bag, we were able to have one last walk in the woods where he was comfortable and able to relax and just enjoy the scenery. Thank you for facilitating a very precious memory. You've also had somebody get engaged. 
We had somebody get engaged in the bag. Well, to be clear, the dog was in the bag. And then, you know, we had, uh, you know, there were just those tornadoes down in Dallas. Somebody told us that we're hiding in the, you know, they, they put their dog inside the little chunk and they hid in the bathroom for a while. And the dog seemed to calm down in the backpack. We've gotten message that from people who are like, you know, you make us thanks. I've had such a tough day. Your videos made me so happy. And, and that's that's very rewarding. It's very fulfilling. But it's an entirely new experience to make something tangible and to mm-hmm. work as hard as we've worked on something and and see the benefits of it, that people are buying a physical product and using it and it keeps your dog safe. You know, it's, it's crazy. In my mind, if we can build something that keeps her her memory alive, all is not lost. So I can imagine a world where she's not here, but what I do have is an absolutely incredible community of people who use a product that she helped literally create. What's your like stress or anxiety level been since you launched Little Chunk? You know, lives can be completely transformed off of one piece of content these days, literally. So I understand that opportunity. And I think the toughest part about TikTok is you're right there. You're right on the edge of a transformation or success. That app, it gives you so much hope. There's such a massive opportunity. So it's it gets really frustrating when you don't realize something that feels like it's within your grasp. The stressful thing is when you're not putting any money behind a paid strategy, which we don't need to do at this point, the success of the business solely relies on the content you create. That is at once incredibly easy for me, but also just incredibly difficult because you could make a piece of content that you think is amazing. It's going to show off the bag and it's going to be like an ad, but not an ad, and it doesn't do well. But we, we just put out a video of Maxine working out the train conductor and I made it and I literally sat on it for a month and I sat on it because I thought like, eh, it's just all right. Like this piece of music is just all right. Like I had an idea of how it would go in my head and it would be way more rewarding to see this conductor deadlift way more weight. You know, I tried different songs, tons of different stuff and I was just like, fuck, like I think we have to reshoot it. And then it got to the point where one day I was like, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to license that track. I'm just going to throw it up. I, you know, I got to let it go. I threw it up. And it was like insane. Front page Reddit, over 100,000 upvotes, flew around the internet, over like 7 million on TikTok. You know, so it's crazy like that. It would be kind of fun if you pulled back the curtain just a teeny bit and talked about like, you know, your your obsession with making everything so great. Like, It's because I know what things could be. So very early on when we would take pictures, when I would take pictures of Max looking really cute, I always photoshopped out the collar and the leash. I would take a picture of her. I would drop the collar and the leash because I couldn't I couldn't take the leash and collar off of her because she likes chasing skateboards and, you know, all, so I would put the <laughs> leash down and I would photoshop it out. And I did that for every single picture. I didn't want the feeling to be such that this was a human's pet. I wanted Maxine to stand on her own mm-hmm. as the central character of this Instagram. You know, obviously what's most important is the person looking at the photo, how's it going to make them feel? But also, you know, if we're in the business of growing an account or making people engage with our content, if there's a higher likelihood that that ear is going to get somebody to like the photo, to follow us, then like, why not spend the 40 minutes to do it? What's the point of going out to take pictures if if there's something I can do to make this better that's not going to really change the DNA of what we're doing? Would you say you're obsessed with your dog's butt? Yeah. She's very cute. Watching her walk is very cute. It's just like, it just shakes left to right when she walks on her little feet. It's the most adorable thing. All anxieties fade away. You know, you think about some of this shit and then you think about some of the other shit and it makes it better. Can you talk a little bit more what you meant when you said exit strategy? I love what we're doing now. I absolutely love it because my life can support it. The most important thing to me at the end of the day, is my family, my mental health and wellness, and the way that I live my life. And the thing that I've said before about this Instagram account is I've made it fit into my life. We've, my wife and I have made it fit into our lives. We are not changing a lot of who we are and what we do. You know, we're not, we're not going to move to LA. We're not going to change industries. Well, actually I have, but as as long as it can fit into the life I want to live and 
I know that in a few years, the media landscape is going to be different and our lives are going to be different. We are talking about having a child. Do I want to be doing this the way that I'm doing it now with a child? I don't think that's possible. I'm sure it will transform into something else, but I always want to keep moving and moving the goalpost and trying something different. And I know that the life we're living now is not physically sustainable, mentally sustainable. It's not, it's not physically sustainable because this dog will, you know, there's no, there's no good way to say it. The dog's going to die. She's six. You know, we, we have a long, we have a long way to go. That's the good news. But she's, let's say what, six years, seven years. And once we have a child, something's going to change. Like, I don't want to be trying to do the same thing when we have a kid because our life is going to completely change. The amount of time we can spend on this is going to completely change. And I know that if I'm trying to get videos of her as consistently as I am, I'm not going to have time to do it. And that's going to put me in the fucking ground because I already mean? feel like I don't have time. And so when we have a kid, I know I'm really not going to have time. And that's not to say that I'm going to give up things in lieu of something else. It's just that things are going to evolve. And I'm trying to put them in a place where they can evolve and where I'm fine with them evolving. So the thought of seeing the idea of being a creator or doing what I do evolve as my life evolves is very exciting to me. Like, let's say in five years, once Maxine has slowed down a little bit or, you know, what's life going to look like? And I have a kid. Am I going to go to an office? Can I... Can I still be working with other really talented artists and creators, but in a different way, mm -hmm. you know, in a different way where I'm not sitting at a computer editing for like eight hours a day? I don't know what that exit strategy is, and maybe exit strategy isn't, isn't a good way to put it, but it's just like, how is this life going to change? I think about the day she's not going to be here. I think about every day, probably multiple times a day. That's not an exaggeration. In the morning, brushing my teeth, driving in the car, the right song comes on. I think about it. So that's pretty scary. A lot of what I'm doing now is to try and cushion that blow to make sure that the music, so to speak, doesn't stop when when she dies. And that doesn't mean trying to find ways to replace her creatively, replace her in my life, you know? I, I think it means trying to find a way to keep what we're doing alive, keep the memory of what we're doing alive so that the impact of her does not die when she dies. And that's what we're trying to do with the backpack and the company. Brian, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks, Gil. Thanks for having me. This is fun. Um, well, it, was, it wasn't really that fun, but it was interesting. And that was Brian Reesberg with a cameo by Maxine the Fluffy Corgi. I think it's pretty cool that Brian was able to push through his self-doubt and make a full-time go at this career. If you want to support Brian, you can find lots of cute Corgi content at Mad Max underscore Fluffy Road on all the major platforms, and you can grab a backpack at littlechonk.com. You know what I'm about to say. Make sure to subscribe to this podcast wherever you subject yourself to it. And if you want unlimited Gilly points, leave a five-star review. Until next time, be kind to yourself. Mentally Gil is executive produced and hosted by me, Gil Kruger. Executive produced by Zach Stewart Pontier. Produced and edited by Melissa DeMonts and Diane Kang of Diamond Emprint Productions. Post-production sound by Sam Baer. Theme song and ad break music by Austin Archer. This has been a Best Regards Media production. <laughs>